Hello, my dearest children. Today's video lecture topic is evolution, which is the process by which species change over time. And more specifically, we're going to be discussing the mechanisms of evolution, or in other words, how this process actually happens. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as I go through the lecture video. Okay, before we can talk about how a species can change or evolve, we need to talk about what a species is. A species are organisms which are capable of two things, reproduction in their natural setting and reproduction of fertile offspring. And fertile offspring means that they can have children, so they can produce offspring that can also have children. That's a species. A group made up of members of the same species is also known as a population, so you're going to sort of hear me use those terms interchangeably. So let's just review real quick. Horses and donkeys can mate to produce mules. Mules are sterile or infertile. So are horses and donkeys members of the same species? Well, they don't meet one of our requirements, so no, they would not be members of the same species. Are all birds members of the same species? For example, can an ostrich mate with a hummingbird? Absolutely not, so birds are different species. What about dogs? Can all dogs mate? Theoretically speaking, of course. They can, actually. This is why we have mixed breeds like Golden Doodles or Schnoodles. Um, if they could figure it out, a Great Dane could actually mate with a Chihuahua, so they are the same species. And then you've all heard of ligers or tigons. Um, lions and tigers can be bred to produce ligers. Lions and tigers are still considered to be different species. Why is that? Even though ligers can produce more ligers, lions and tigers would never reproduce in their natural setting because they live in entirely different continents. So we consider them different species. Okay, we can't talk about evolution without talking about Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is the most important person when it comes to, to the idea or the concept of evolution being introduced. And he was a British naturalist, which just like it sounds, it meant that he was sort of a scientist in charge of studying nature. And he was hired to travel on the HMS Beagle, which was a ship, during the 1830s in order to learn as much as he could about the living things he saw on his voyage. Sounds like a great job, a job I would want. So the HMS Beagle traveled to the Galapagos Islands uh, of South America. So right here, sort of off the coast of Ecuador, are the Galapagos Islands. So this is where Darwin made some of his most important observations and where he really drew some of his first conclusions regarding evolution. So some of the animals that he observed were finches with a variety of beaks, and that's really the go-to example that we usually discuss when we're talking about Charles Darwin. But he also observed iguanas with different claws and tortoises with different shaped shells. So we're going to talk about the finches first because, like I said, this is our, our usually our go-to example of, of evolution in relation to Charles Darwin. So he observed that the finches of the Galapagos Islands were very different from one island to the next. So he saw that there were some finches that had these big broad beaks, and then he saw that there were some that had these short beaks, and then he saw that there were some that had like needle beaks and some sort of in between. So they varied in shape and size. And what he noticed was that each species of bird, their beak was well suited or well adapted to the life that it led, to the food source that was available to them. So these, these little birds that had these sharp needle-like beaks, those ate insects because that's what was available to them in their environment. The ones, the finches that were on islands that had seeds available to them had these big, strong, wide beaks. So he thought that was pretty interesting. And he observed that iguanas sort of had the same thing. There were iguanas on the mainland, and there were iguanas on island on the islands. And the island iguanas had large claws, which helped them to keep from slipping off the rocks. And the mainland iguanas had small claws, which actually allowed them to climb trees where they were able to eat leaves. So Darwin concluded that the finches on each of the Galapagos Islands must face conditions that are different from one another, and they're well adapted to those conditions. So he came up with a conclusion that a species or a population must gradually change over many generations, becoming better adapted to their environment. And adaptations, this is on your notes organizer, adaptations are those traits that help an organism survive and reproduce. We've talked about adaptations all year long. And that gradual change in a species over time is known as evolution. So if the environment changed, if the island's food source changed, then you would see a change in the bird species population. So if all of a sudden there were no seeds, you know, maybe there was some sort of natural disaster and then you just had a lot of insects, then you would see a change from big broad finches, beaked finches, to small needle-like beaked finches.
And so this is where we came up with the theory of evolution. Darwin was the first to present that idea. And it was, it was in the, the book, The Origin of Species, where he first used the term, the theory of evolution and natural selection. So what is a scientific theory? The theory of evolution. You have the theory of gravity. What is a theory? A theory is a well-tested concept that explains a wide range of observation. In other words, it's a conclusion that's been drawn based on a significant amount of data that supports it. So the theory of evolution is what scientists have concluded to be true regarding how species change over time. This explanation is based on significant amounts of research, observations, and many sources of evidence. If there was something to change this idea, then we would change our, our concept of the theory of evolution. Just like if all of a sudden I dropped an apple and it floated upwards, then we would revise our idea of the theory of gravity. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've sort of presented this idea of evolution, how does it actually happen? So Darwin explained that a species must change over time as a result of natural selection. And natural selection's nickname, which you've probably heard a million times, is survival of the fittest. So natural selection, or survival of the fittest, is the process by which the environment selects the most well-adapted organisms for survival and therefore reproduction. So based on the environment, certain organisms are selected because they're well-adapted, so they're going to survive, they're going to reproduce, which means those traits are going to get passed on to future generations. So individuals that are better adapted to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce than other members of the same species. So this is, you know, this brings up fitness or survival of the fittest. What does fitness mean? So fittest does not mean strongest. In some cases it might mean strongest, but it's not synonymous. Sometimes fitness means, you know, being the tallest tree or having the tree with the deepest roots. Fittest just means the best adapted. So the fitness of an organism is in regards to how uh, well adapted it is to its environment. So Charles Darwin, along with the biologist Alfred Russell Wallace, published his explanation in a book called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. You've probably heard that before. But this was the first manuscript that put in print, you know, the, the idea of evolution by means of natural selection. And it's, you know, a book that's still used by scientists today to draw conclusions regarding evolution. Okay, so Factors that affect the process of natural selection, there are three that we're going to discuss, overproduction, competition, and genetic variation. And I'm going to go fairly quickly through these because they're really not very complicated and you've heard most of this before. So overproduction is simply the production of far more offspring than can possibly survive. So for example, sea turtles lay more than 100 eggs. If all the young sea turtles survived, the sea would be full of sea turtles. Obviously we know that's not the case, not all of the, all of the offspring will survive. So overproduction introduces competition, making it more likely that only the members with the best adaptations survive. That's its impact on natural selection. So put that in your chart there, that last bullet. Okay, so here's an example of overproduction. Sea turtles we just talked about. Really only like two or three of those are going to survive into adulthood. Frog eggs, of course. Look at all those eggs. Not all of those are going to grow into adulthood. Many will become tadpoles and then very few will become adult frogs. Maple seeds, so only a couple of these seeds are going to grow into full maple trees. That's overproduction. So now let's move on to competition. And competition, like I said, we've talked about since the beginning of the school year. Competition is when organisms aim to utilize the same resources. That could be food, that could be water, that could be living space, that could be mates, whatever. Offspring have to compete with each other to survive and offspring have to compete with other organisms in order to be able to survive. So the most well-adapted organisms are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing those beneficial traits onto the next generation. So that's its impact on natural selection. So again, going back to our sea turtles, there they are com competing for space. Moving on to genetic variation. Genetic variation is the key to evolution. Genetic variation is any difference between individuals in the same species. That is a variation, and which are a result of genetics. Not the environment, genetics. So this could be caused by two things. Mutations, which you know is just a change in a genetic sequence, or the shuffling of alleles in sexual reproduction. So you know, sexual reproduction creates genetic variation. 
A strong species is one in which there are many differences between individuals. If you've got variety, then there's an increase in the chances that some of the individuals are going to de survive despite the changes in the environment. If you've got a crop with genetic variation, they can survive a variety of different pests or natural disasters. If they're all genetically identical, they're all going to be wiped out by the same thing. So a strong species is one that is genetically varied. So again, sea tur going back to sea turtles, they're born with a variety of traits. Some are fast on land, others are fast swimmers, some are darker colored, some are lighter colored. And that variation is what ensures that at least some of these little guys are going to survive. So again, I just sort of talked about this. Clones which have identical genes and are therefore strong and weak in the same areas. One event is going to wipe out the entire population. Genetic variation means that not all members of a population are susceptible to the same illnesses, environmental changes, etc. The individuals best fit for the environmental conditions survive and pass their traits to the next generation. So here's an example of um, you know, the benefit of genetic variation. The Irish potato famine in 1843. This happened because there was a lack of variation. All these clones were genetically identical, or the, all these potatoes were clones or genetic genetically identical to one another and they all succumbed to one single fungus species that wiped out the whole potato crop for two years starving about one million people. In the other direction genetic variation is the reason that we have bacteria that are now able to survive against all these strong medicines. We have antibiotic resistance. So we've talked about this before but basically you know you introduce antibiotics to bacteria. Um, some of them because they produce they can produce, uh, reproduce sexually through conjugation, some of them are going to be able to survive that antibiotic. If they survive, they do what? They reproduce and they pass those genes on to future generations. So if you don't finish all your antibiotics, the strongest few are left behind to multiply. So if you get sick again, you actually need a different, stronger antibiotic to kill the stronger bacteria. The bacteria have evolved by natural selection to survive the environmental pressures in your body. This is an example of microevolution in action. <clears throat> so this has led to a sort of arms race, just like it did in you know, the world wars, always trying to build the bigger weapons. We're always trying to beat these superbugs. An example of a superbug is MRSA, which is medicinally resistant staph infection. And then same idea beside, behind pesticide resistance. We have all these pests that are now become resistant to these, to these chemicals that we use to kill them. And that's because the ones that are able to resist it or have that sort of immunity to it are surviving. They're the ones reproducing. And then that immunity is getting passed on to future generations. Okay, so if we're talking about evolution and the theory of evolution being based on significant amounts of evidence and data, we have to talk about what some of those sources of evidence are. So the first source we're going to talk about is the fossil record. We're also going to talk about anatomical evidence, molecular evidence, and embryonic development. So fossils provide a great deal of information about species that are no longer here on Earth. They're an important source of information in determining the ancestry of organisms and the pattern of evolution. Now we have to be able to date those fossils and there are two real ways to date fossils. One is relative dating. This allows you to determine which fossil is older, which species is older than the other based on looking at their location in the sediment. So the oldest rocks are, or the oldest fossils are going to be down in, in the uh, lower rocks and the newer species are going to be found up at the upper surface. That's just relative dating. This is older than this. Absolute or radiometric dating is using the decay of radioactive isotopes to measure the exact age of a rock. So using things like carbon dating to determine that this species or this fossil was, you know, 50 million years old. That's absolute dating or radiometric dating. So here are some examples of fossils, which is simply, you know, an imprint or something left behind of an organism. Again, fossils. Yep, that's poop, coprolite. The last piece of evidence for evolution that I'm going to talk about in this video lecture is anatomical evidence, or looking at the anatomy or body of organisms. 
So three things you need to know. Homologous structures. These are structures that are anatomically similar and inherited from a common ancestor even though they might perform different functions. So the human arm and a bat wing perform very different functions, but if you look at the anatomy, the bone makeup, they're actually very similar to one another. So we would consider them homologous structures. Analogous structures, on the other hand, are used for the same purpose, in this case flight, but their anatomy is very different from one another. And then vestigial structures are sort of leftover structures, structures that no longer have a use in an organism. That's it for today. We'll go over the rest in class.